Okay, so Morgan, tell me the story so everybody else can hear about what you experienced as we were preparing this podcast on styles of relating. Yeah, Alan. So we're about to go to an older treasure, right? This yes. content released a while back. And I was back into that content this week. And it's on the styles of relating at a marriage retreat with Sherry and I were hosting with Craig and Lori McConnell, John and Stacy. And Sherry was telling a story about our courtship. And she was describing the dynamics at work of she's in Nashville, I'm in Colorado, and she felt pressure from me for her to only move to Colorado if we were engaged. And she was wanting room for us to do some normal life because we just had these power dates and these intense weekends, but never did normal life. So I'm listening to this audio from years ago, a teaching on styles of relating, <laughs> and everything in me is like, who is that guy? Like, <laughs> what a jerk. Why would she stay with him? And this was a teaching from healing, from restoration. And so it was just this beautiful moment to remember we're all in process yes. and we're not who we were and we aren't who we one day will be. And it was a joy to just bring Sherry today back into that conversation and pick it up and go for the next chapter together. That's so good. So friends, welcome to the Wild at Heart podcast. I'm Alan, this is Morgan. And what you're about to hear is a Become Good Soil podcast from several years ago, and it is on styles of relating, but, but we want to also take this time to invite you into the deeper waters that is Become Good Soil. And if you're not familiar with those podcasts or that world, we encourage you to dive deeper into that. There's so much more. But for today, we thought we'd bring back one from many years ago that's as relevant now as it's ever been. And it's on Styles of Relating. And Morgan, what is the title of this one? Yeah, this one's called Getting Naked. And <laughs> it just fits. It takes courage. It takes authenticity to kind of, on a soulful level with someone you love, pull your pants down and say, I am who I am. It is what it is. <laughs> but friends, like, be encouraged. We land with hope. We're going to dive into some deep waters, but it's hopeful, it's accessible, and it's going to help you understand the people entrusted to your care and learn how to love out of more wholeheartedness. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Man, it's just so much easier to talk about marriage when she's not there. <laughs> <laughs> You can do it, buddy. We're story. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, exactly. M McConnell, Just, McConnell. I've listened. I've listened to the resources. McConnell's taught me it, it's not the story, it's the storytelling. It's the art of storytelling. The truth is, actually, we love marriage. Mm -hmm. And this is on time. That's one of the words the Father's given us is this is on time because we've fought through a lot of fire mm -hmm. to get to the place where we're best friends. And we're doing pretty well right now <laughs> after going through right, a lot as of, of this crap. 11 o'clock. Right, in the last seven good. minutes, we're doing amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. The word I've been getting over all of you is we are a fellowship who has persevered. To everyone in this room, we have persevered. And the two verses that have been coming is from Luke 8 of by persevering, produce a crop. But then also through Craig and Lori in that last session, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And Paul's not talking about morality. Morality can't carry you through that mm -hmm. or carry you through this. Paul's talking about wholehearted integration yes, of the human person. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces wholehearted integration of the human person on the level of the soul. And that produces hope. Mm -hmm. Yes, God. That's where our hope comes from. It's rooted and established in the love of God, mm -hmm. healing the soul. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, there's no area that's caused more pain and harm than marriage and no area mm -hmm. that's producing more fruit mm -hmm. in allowing us to become wholehearted and for us to bring life and love to others. Any just thoughts before yes. we get underway? God gave us this phrase um, 
ask, invite us to ask for the full portion of what's available between a man and a woman on this side of heaven. The full portion of what's available between a man and a woman on this side of heaven. I just um, invite you guys to join us in asking that for your own marriage. And we just, I just want to open in prayer. Please. And, um, yeah. Oh, God. Um, thank you for the moment of heaven and earth, God, touching as we lingered in the wake of Craig and Lori's story, God, for the holiness, for the tactile presence of the living God. And so, God, we, we bring ourselves back. We bring ourselves back to that place. Thank you that the atmosphere is permeated, God, with you, that you are permeating the space around us. And we ask now, God, that the, the, the flame of love that exists within the, the Godhead, the fellowship of the burning heart that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that you would kindle love, God, in each of us, that love, God, for you, we would feel it um, ember stirred into roaring flame. And God, for every man, for his wife, and every woman, for her husband, God, places that have been dormant or slumbering or ashen, God, we ask that you would kindle life, Mm -hmm. that you who bring life from death, God, would bring life. And and in the image of Lori taking those stones out and and depositing Mm -hmm. good soil, we ask in Jesus' name, God, through the course of this weekend and through this session, that you would take stony places in us and that you would replace it with good soil. Yes. Father, thank you for this moment in time. Thank you for these friends. We are so honored. And Jesus, I ask, as as Craig described you walking into the room, we ask you to walk into this room. Yes, yes. Walk into this room, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. So a few years ago, uh, my rope was tied in a bunch of knots, as it often is, and I found myself at Craig's desk, where I often do, him and other elders in my life. And, and Craig said something very profound to me. He said, how we relate with other people is one of the greatest indicators of our spiritual maturity. Bottom line, forget our doctrine, forget our accomplishments, forget our kingdom. How we relate with other people is one of the greatest indicators of our spiritual maturity. And I wasn't relating very well. And in the kind of rubric of relationships, there's no relating that's more central in the human experience than relating with our spouse. And it took me on a journey, which John had asked us to share what's most fresh, what's most current in our marriage. And it's this very current for us of wondering together with God and with each other, pretty honestly, of how do we relate? What's going on between us and what is my effect on you? And a lot of it was rooted in this teaching on the predominant styles of relating. So Karen Horney did research on this in the 40s or 50s. She wrote a book called Our Inner Conflict. It's pretty heady and and verbose, but it's amazing kind of research on understanding relationships in a way that's very accessible. John Smeltzer teaches a lot on it. John mentioned last night. Brene Brown teaches on it. And we've just kind of, um, what's the word, gone through it all Mm -hmm. to try to make, sifted it, kind of sifted it to make it as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of tools to get to the heart of the human soul and God's work to restore. But the tool of understanding the predominant styles of relating and finding out what our predominant style is ourselves and seeing it in its broken form, and then seeing God dismantle that and restore the true man and woman has been an incredible tool for us, really accessible uh, doorway to walk through to more healing for our marriage. Um, So this morning, what we want to do, just by way of prologue, to bring you back to that, Craig's taught on it on the advance, taught on it in the intensive, it's in the collection, but this morning, if you're not familiar with it, we wanted to bring you back to it for the whole purpose of setting up some conversation, honest <laughs> dialogue. Yes. Thoughts on that before I'd go into it? I was thinking about this last night um, as John was, was offering. And I think that it's, it's tempting, you know, particularly something like this, where there's like, you know, where are you going to hand you guys like a handout? 
that has like a spreadsheet. I, I didn't do this. I I don't know how <laughs> how to do stuff like this, but my husband can like put things in a list and a with the team spreadsheet. Out. Thank you, team. But the the point is, is that um, okay? So it's easy to be like it's similar to what John was saying. Yes, I have a tool out of my suffering. I have a tool out of my pain, and I'm going to get really good at this and see if I can avoid pain in my marriage. We're not offering this as a mm-hmm. as an off ramp from pain. Um, I, I think, given what John was saying, that the dysfunction in our styles of relating is actually a fabulous way to trace the contour mm-hmm. back to a wound or back to a split in your soul, in my soul. And so we're not offering it as like a, um, to go back to John and Brent's phrase, a tip and technique mm-hmm. for how to avoid pain. I were that it was, and in fact, but, but would we even want that? No. Um, we're, we're offering it because it's been hugely helpful to us. Mm-hmm. And um, we wanted to offer it to you, but, but with the hope of, of going back to that, that we might be one, that we might be whole, that we might not just adjust the behavior, but we might go, go to the root and allow God to heal and encounter us there. And then that the style of relating will, will shift from that encounter with God. So this morning, what we're going to consider is three primary styles of relating, okay? Move away, move towards, and move against. And as Sherry said, we'll give you the handout with some, some detailed words. So the purpose of this moment is to just experience it, kind of let it soak in, consider it in your spirit. But we all have a primary style of relating. It's how we engage the world, okay? And most of us, in most of our relating, that's out of the false self. We talk about in Captivating, it's Fallen Eve. In Boot Camp, it's the poser. All of it is the fig leaf, this false person that we've created, a sophisticated, highly developed person to make life work outside of God. It's how we make life work. It's how we self-protect. It's how we arrange for a very small story. This phrase, I feel death if I don't, dot, 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 okay? The false self, that, that's this construct. And, and here's the key that really helps me. It's largely a reaction. It's habituated. Thomas Keating says it's like a computer program, like the operating system. You power it on and it just does its deal every time. Our false self is like that. So your primary style relating in service of the false self is programmed, habitual, and reactive, okay? And it's a self-protection mechanism. So I want to walk through all three in its broken form. These are, these are negative, Okay. So the person who moves away, the person who moves away, withdraws and hides, has a propensity to disengage and check out. Life is thought through self-preservation and creating emotional distance between them and other people. There's this kind of magic inner circle that they don't let you in. So you can get along with a move away person, but that's actually part of their self-protection to get along to keep you from the real core of their heart. They refuse to risk engagement because of fear of exposure and not having what it takes. That's the move away. The move towards is the compliant person. Here's the phrase. I need you to like me. I need us to be okay so that I'm okay. Okay, do you know this person? They appease and please to avoid rejection. They feel secure when connected with others, even if it's an unhealthy or unholy connection. There's this compulsive need to be liked and to a compulsive need to serve others. They avoid com- conflict and they self-protect by not rocking the boat. They make others feel good. You feel good so that I am worthy of love and belonging. And all of these are just exhausting because it's do it again. Do it again. The false self, you have to do it again. It's self-generated rather than God-generated, as John talked about last night. Move against. Here's the key phrase that we just... So we kind of sifted through Smeltzer, Brene, and Karen and came with the best words we could find to capture these styles. Move against. It's follow or get out of the way. Aggression and domination is kind of the atmosphere around a move against person that life is primarily battle, and and move against feels best when we're in control or we're in charge. In other words, it feels like death when I'm not leading. 
what can I gain from this? How can I ex- succeed or achieve or win? Outcomes are extremely important, and fear is my fuel. Never at rest. Always focused on the next thing, even if it's a good thing, the next thing, the next thing. Willing to sacrifice relationship for ambition or success or what feels like positive outcomes. Move against people don't handle criticism well, and the rules don't apply to us. Another phrase would be, it's my way or the highway. Those would be the three predominant styles in the service of the false self. I'm curious if you guys can guess what Morgan and I's (laughs) predominant styles are in the service of the false self. Go ahead. Try us. Come on. Yeah? How would you Why guess? would you say that? <laughs> I, uh, oh. Yeah, exactly. You, you are listen, too. You slipped into like the first person. Do you, you're like, we. This is a we. I? See, I, I can't describe him because I am him. Right? Bingo, bingo. Okay, um, how about me? What's my compulsive? Aggression? Dysfunctional. Yeah, aggression. Two. You guys. Move to her. Right. Oh, nailed right, me. Right. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. Some of you are going... Uh, I know exactly what I am, right? I'm just classic move against, and I know the other of you that are move against as well. Um, and some of you, you may actually misdiagnose yourself, and you need outside eyes, okay? So don't be too quick. Um, but again, it's not tips and techniques. This is a tool to get to the human soul and how we relate in service of the false self. Now let me walk through the restoration of these, okay? This... These three styles are the image of God manifesting in us. Here it's in the service of the false self. They're meant to be dismantled and restored, as John was saying last night, to walk in union with God, okay? So rather than a reaction and habitually, you know how I will respond, move against, we actually respond. There's a sacred pause. There's a responding a union with God and a movement that actually transcends our personality. Yes. Okay? It's, it's, it's the most remarkable quality I've seen about Jesus' life. He moves away. He moves towards. He moves against. And you can make an argument for all three to be his predominant style because he's fluid, constantly in union with his Father, responding out of love, always in the service of love. And that's where we're maturing into. So you'll always have your predominant style. It's meant for good, but it needs to be restored. And we need to mature in the other two. Mm -hmm. So our styles in their true self, just receive this. Mm -hmm. Move away has a monastic heart. They've experienced the reality of be still and know that I am God. These are contemplative hearts. Their secret life is deeply rooted in God. They're at peace. They welcome stillness. And they don't need to be God for another person or to come through compulsively. There's no agreement with a false urgency. They trust God's timing and God's way rather than self-determination or make life happen on my own terms. Move away people that are wholehearted, model self-care. They invite others into that core kingdom reality. They have healthy boundaries. They can play and have embraced unforced rhythms of grace. They they know on an intimate heart level, the yoke is easy and the burden is light in the midst of suffering and hard assignments. Move towards. These people, like my bride, Mm. have an extraordinary capacity for empathy. They manifest the miracle of holy validation. (laughs) When with another, they communicate the kingdom reality that nobody or nothing is more important in the world to God than the heart of his beloved. A holy move toward reveals that others are worthy of love and belonging just because they are. Move move toward have a profound capacity to intercede, to come to the center of another person's reality with affection, compassion. They can share another person's pain and their hope and be selfless in that sharing. They generously open their heart to others, and they cultivate holy and true intimacy and connection. A move against person, when in the service of love, out of the true man, in union with God, present tense reality union, is a natural leader. 
They lead with a servant's heart and they serve with a royal heart because they know that they are the sons and daughters of God. That's where their identity and their validation is rooted. They're men and women of action and engagement who walk in a harnessed and yielded strength. They make room for others to thrive, but they'll sacrifice finances, influence, all that's at their uh, disposal for others to thrive. They walk in authority, but they also submit to the authority of others as God would lead them. They have a deep confidence, yet they have a humility to listen, to defer, and to lean into the counsel of others. They'll spend themselves on a worthy cause and risk love in a way that's not tied to outcomes. They truly care and about investing and building God's kingdom more than their own. They care more about your heart than your usefulness as a means to their end. People that move against in the service of love willing, are willing to lovingly and courageously confront others for the sake of their growth and restoration. That's what that confrontation's for about. I want to see you wholehearted and become more that I am through the spending of my strength and love or beauty and life-giving yes, on behalf of a worthy cause. Reactions on those? I think what is um, interesting is where we can spiritualize our false self. And um, some of you have heard different parts of our story, but for years, and really um, it's only been in the last two years, I'd say that God has really delivered Morgan and I from a cycle of pain that was excruciating mm-hmm. for both of us. So in his, my compulsive move toward... Um, and my passivity and my voicelessness. I was sort of like a hybrid move toward, move away. Um, I grew very voiceless, and I didn't know how to... um, Sometimes it felt like I was um, respecting Morgan by not challenging him, by going quiet. And um, I realized, in fact, what I think is really profound about a compulsive move toward is that I really robbed him of the gift of healthy, mature companionship. First of all, in my, are, are we okay? Are we okay? So in, when he comes home and he's stressed from work and he steps on the like cheese it that's crumbling in the, on the kitchen floor and he grimaces, I make it about me. Are we okay? Am I okay? Did I offend you? Rather than being able to give him permission to be in a bad mood, and to, to encounter his God, rather he feels like he's to zip himself up, so I'm okay. And he doesn't get to just be, he doesn't get to rest in mature adult com- companionship. And furthermore, there were places where God wants me to, um, in love and tenderness and empathy, but to invite him to come out of the false self and, and be the man I know him to be. But because of my fear, because of my intimidation, because of my cow. I mean, truly, my self-preservation of I'm loved if I make him feel really good about himself and really good about every decision. I'm, to borrow Brene Brown's phrase, I'm worthy of human consumption. I'm worthy of love and belonging if I can make him feel really good. Meanwhile, not giving voice started to really turn um, a lot of, I, I'd feel angry, I felt resentful, I felt trapped, I felt a lot of things, and, and really um, got turned, among other things, against <coughs> myself. I didn't know what to do with how um, miserable that I was in that dynamic and how much pain I knew I was causing him as well. And my compulsive move against that deep-seated vow in my false self, I am loved when I come through for others by conquering, by leading. Here I am trying to lead our family, trying to walk with God, and something in me knows, okay, I'm right, and we're going to implement this. And I'm just bulldozing with such a strength, much of it in the service of false, that I'm just running her over, right? So we're in a marriage counseling office um, recently, and having been healed a lot and worked through a lot, like John said, finally, we're in this office. I'm like, we're going to have a good appointment, like for the first time ever, ever, 14 (laughs) years. It's our first good one. And we sit there, and are you okay if I share this just a little bit? Um, and, and I'm like, knock it ew. Like, bring it up. Let's rock and roll. Like, our marriage is rocking. Let's, let's bring the kingdom. And she's just looking over, and she's just cr- starting to tear up, cry, cry, wilting. And I'm like, 
this is about me and this isn't good. I'm not the same. <laughs> and she begins to describe this image of being like a bird in a cage where I'd stilted her and, and stifled her actually in some areas where I thought my memory is that I was being very heroic in risking, in, lo- in, in living courageously, but in fact, it wasn't in the service of love. It was what I thought, like Paul says, whatever we do, if not done in love, it's a waste. I actually was not on behalf of the other's interest, but what I thought, what I knew to be good for her and our family, and she was wilting under my aggression, and even to the point where, you know, we went through some hard times with your depression, and, and it's just in recent years that we realized, like, I was a huge causative factor, though other things were in play, of just my move against compulsively, because it feels death when I don't, that I had actually deeply contributed to that, which it's been hard to kind of walk through. So we have a predominant style. It's mostly in the service of false self. God is in the process, primarily in marriage, to make us aware of what our style is, to give us this holy opportunity to actually put the gloves down and put the rocks down and step away from our predominant style so that we can strengthen and mature in the, I'll call it the opposite spirit, the opposite energy of these other styles, and so that we can be restored and made whole, the integration of the whole soul, where like Jesus, we have the freedom to move in and through all three and in a way that is supernatural and brings the kingdom and is not reactive but responding to God's power and presence in this moment. So we we have an exercise for you guys. And uh, we are going to model that exercise because Jesus told us to. And that's the only reason we're going to do this. Uh, Sherry, any thoughts on this exercise just as we frame this? So I... um I, as I was praying and considering this exercise, I just I sort of felt this caution, and I, it may be because this is my story, so this may not be your story, but for us, there was actually so much pain around this that we really needed a safe, contained environment. Um, and so this exercise that we're going to offer, which is essentially getting feedback from your spouse on what your dominant style of relating is, it may be something for this weekend, or it may be something where you just know with Jesus, you need a, a, a safe contain. You need some containment around that because to open up stuff that we don't have the, you know, the structure and the, the support, the sucker in place to be able to um, be tended to by God it can sometimes be uh, more harm than help. So I just want to be a little bit sober that um, for us, like I was like wailing in the counselor's office with this. So it, I don't necessarily want you guys to have to like wail through your weekend. So this may not be, <laughs> this may not be for this weekend, or you may have done some work in preparation. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is so current. This is exactly what God is doing, and this is we were so excited yeah. to go after it. So so you walk with God with it, but we entrust it to you because it's a it's a very in our experience in marriage a, a very accessible tool to get to the heart of both how we cause pain, but then also this miracle of validation coming to the center of each other's experience, knowing you'll get your turn. You'll get your turn. So this isn't to defend. This isn't to explain. This is to simply, I love you, because greater act um, has no man than this than lay his life down for a friend. And so you're worthy to come to the center of your experience for your sake as my friend, and experience that reality, knowing you'll do the same for me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So uh, this morning, we're only going to do it one way in honor of time because of what we want to offer to you. So I felt like it was Sherry's turn. Um, so Sherry, I know you love me, and you're for me more than anyone in this world is for me. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And we love these friends. Um, and so what I would ask is, what, what would you say is your... Ex- and we've been through this multiple rounds, but there's always something new, like this morning and last night. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what, what would you say is my predominant style of relating to you when in service of my false self? How do you experience relating to me in that style, and how does it affect you? 
I just have to break out of this moment for a second of um, just to see his tears and his tenderness. I, wish, I kind of wish it were opposite. I wish I were going to own my stuff with him because I have harmed him and uh, w- uh, wounded him and not been who I want to be in our marriage. But by the grace of God, we are really growing. So um, thank you for giving me this chance. I was actually, because Morgan and I have been through this lot and it's been so life-giving, I was asking Jesus for a fresh story today because I wanted it to be, um, I didn't want to be forced. I didn't want to be kind of like acting. I wanted it to be real. So <clears throat> this particular dynamic between us, my compulsive move toward and his um, move against, but I would venture to say I think your predominant style is move against. <laughs> Very insightful. You could be a counselor. (laughs) Just taking a shot in the dark, just putting some dots together. Um, This really operated a lot in our early marriage. And um, I remember I was at Vanderbilt, and we were, uh, Morgan had moved out to to Colorado. Let's let's do this exercise and let them enjoy us. We had moved out. Okay. You had moved to Colorado, and I was still at Vanderbilt. And I remember calling you. It was early in the morning. Or you called me, and I was sitting actually on the floor of the kitchen of our apartment. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, somehow we got on the conversation of me, when would I move out to Colorado? It was my senior year. And I remember saying something to the effect of, I wanted to move out to Colorado before we got engaged Mm -hmm. so that we would have some time to share daily life because we had, um, had most of our, relationship had been these intense like weekends that were mm-hmm. euphoric and amazing but not real life mm-hmm. and that you were really adamant that um, you wanted to be engaged first and to me it almost felt like um like like legalistic or something mm-hmm. like and or or like that you felt like it would be um the valiant thing to do the mm-hmm. right thing to do would be to like not have this woman risk moving out if, unless she like is guaranteed a marriage. Yes. And I think what I was saying was, I don't feel like I know you that well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, I know it's the right thing. Come on, let's do it. <laughs> I know exactly what we should do. I don't think I know you that well, and I think it would really be helpful for us to spend some time mm. living in the same place. And you were so persuasive and you had so many great and amazing reasons why we should get engaged first. And I remember getting off that phone and just sort of feeling deflated and feeling, um, but also like I wanted, like everything you said made so much sense. And I, I was like, that makes so much sense. You're right. That's what we should do. But I made some shift. I turned, uh, I turned away from mm-hmm. something that my heart was trying to say. And I said, you're right. He's, he's right. What was I thinking? We should mm-hmm. get engaged before I move out. And um, I realized that I think if I had had more practice in the other styles of relating, I was thinking about it um, this morning when I was blow drying my hair, I might have said, okay, if, if you'd rather be engaged before I move out to Colorado, what about the option of you moving to Tennessee until we're ready to get engaged? I could have explored, yes. had a voice to yes. be winsome still, yes. and, um, but, but offered an opportunity instead of getting really quiet. Yes. And, and there, a little part of me broke off. And there was a, a part of me, that 22-year-old, who felt abandoned by myself because I didn't listen to my own voice. And though she, she's shown up in our marriage, and she's, she's been in a lot of pain. Yes. So let me come to the center of that and tell me if I'm hearing you correctly that... In our courtship in those early days, that as we were moving towards each other, probably towards marriage, I had a strong position to say, you're not coming out to Colorado until we're engaged. And I was, your experience of me, was, I was pretty forceful. And it, the word you used was, I was persuasive, mm-hmm. which is a really um, helpful and painful word because mm-hmm. at the time it sounds smooth and I feel right. But you're, you, what you're saying is you felt deflated by me and that I was stifling you and shutting down your voice and actually a part of you broke off. Mm-hmm. So in that moment, though you didn't show it to me, right. what I hear you saying is you hid something that was a yes. deflation yes. and a breaking off. Yes. And 
and what I hear you saying is my style in that was kind of bulldozing mm-hmm. my agenda. Mm-hmm. And I hear you saying that what you wish you would have offered was an alternative way. Mm-hmm. And that might have been something like maybe I moved to Nashville, which was completely freaked me out. Mm-hmm. But you would have had the courage to offer that, and I would have had to deal with that. Right, and maybe that would have, that idea God might have opened up a, a third way that yes. would have been neither, all yeah. or nothing for either of us. So Cher, yeah. tell me a little more, using the word deflated, I, I really want to mm-hmm. hear what else does that do? Because that's a story, mm-hmm. but it's metaphor for our 14, 15 years of a pattern. Mm -hmm. I I, I know you love me. I want to hear more about what is the effect of my style. Sadly, I also think that 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 22-year-old and then the places that have broken off or been, however, whatever the, I don't know the the actually necessarily anatomically what's happening in my soul, but they became very resentful and angry and pissed and frustrated. But without a voice, it's really, and without, I mean, I I, um, can honestly say I didn't, couldn't identify being angry at that time in my life. Like, I could not identify the mo- emotion of anger. R- red flare, that's, that's, a, that's really disconcerting. But I couldn't, I didn't know what to do, but I, it became, went underground. Yes. And this resentment and this anger and this, um, so, so that happened. And then I think just a, a, a despondency and a hopelessness of, I don't have any way to affect our, our path mm. and our trajectory, but also, but you are the leader and you're a man and you have such great ideas and they all sound mm. really great. Um, but what I, so what I hear you saying is there were things forming in you as a, as a response to this yes. that were not being expressed, right. but the anger's building, yes. the resentment you said, yes. despondency, yes. hopelessness, it's building. Yes with every one of these interactions that you nor I know at the time. And that it's just getting, it's these deeper fissures. So what I hear you say is God's healing other places in us, maybe on more superficial levels. On the deepest level, we keep hurting each other and harming each other even more. Yes, yes. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, that, that, no, it's good. I'm honored by that, and that's a fresh story. And guys, let me just tell you, so what's going on inside? So the... The true man in me, is, and this has grown over time and where it started breaking in Craig's office, realizing she's the last person in the world I want to hurt. You know? If there's anyone I want to come through for in this world, it's you. And here I am causing the most harm. It's very sobering. And that's the first thing that allowed me to do the Matthew 7, like it really is the plank in my eye. It really is before the speck in her eye. And the verse says, so that you can remove the speck in her eye and she can be healed. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not just beat yourself up. It's Mm -hmm. here's the proportion Jesus is setting up in this environment. What she's sharing is my plank. And what I'm feeling in my justification is the speck. And here's the deal. Like we're only doing one side here. You know that you'll get your turn. Okay, so this is not your turn because the false man in me is feeling like, you don't understand. Like God, I was rescued by God in college and came into this intimacy that was new and young and girls were my addiction and now I'm honoring a woman in love and I'm pursuing a woman in purity and heroism and this is so foreign and I feel like I'm walking with God. And that's the false man in me and all those things are true, but it's not love because love is, I have violated the one I love the most. And so what I want you guys to see is in this exercise, I'm feeling him, okay? I'm feeling the false man that wants to justify or explain. You can write that word down. This is not the time to explain. This is the time to come to the center and receive and hear and empathize. And it might even be in this exercise, you guys don't talk about it. You don't process it after that point. You stay there. And it may take a week or a month for your spirit to consider what the experience has been of your spouse Mm -hmm. before you can honestly come to a posture of of I'm sorry and ownership. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. Yeah. Given the time, I would feel honored if you would actually reverse the exercise. You don't want to... I really do. Don't you think... 
<laughs> Don't you look at the model number two? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Morgan, what is my predominant style of relating when in the surface of my false self? How do you experience relating to me when I operate in this style? And how has it affected you? See, a men's retreat, you can kind of say anything. And then, like, if it goes wrong, you're like, hey, we're guys. That was a misfire. But so I'm aware I, like, don't want to throw you under the bus in front Um, of people. I'm secure in my God. Okay. (laughs) I think so. I might take that back. (laughs) Guys, have seen the Budweiser commercial? It's only weird if it doesn't work, you know? Um, I think it, would, it, would, it actually is a, sure. it's a beautiful chance to be not a compulsive moving toward, to get to have the chance, like yeah, a compulsive your moving voice. toward can't receive um, criticism either. And, and therefore, she's really hard to, re- she or he is hard to relate to because if, she, if you criticize her, she goes to shame. And for you to exercise a move against to say, hey, we're going to change the agenda a little. Yep. It's my turn, so okay. way to go. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Don't be, don't be um, so you are a move towards, and as in the description, I pretty much wrote this description, the true self, that's you. You have a capacity for empathy and, and compassion and coming to the center like I've never seen in a human, and that's why I fell in love with you, watching you with the staff at Vanderbilt and people that most people are blind to and you loving them. But when it's in the service of the false self... It does feel that, are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay now? Now are we okay? Are we okay? And I'm like, no, now we're not okay. We're not okay. Oh, shit, we're not okay. I mean, we're okay. It's just kind of tiring. Um, And I feel, my my experience is like, um, just give an example, like our summer trips, the summer with our families. You know, family is just the messiest place for this as we mature. That's mm-hmm. the place that just keeps us sober mm-hmm. of all the places we haven't mm-hmm. matured. Mm-hmm. So with your family, mm-hmm. it felt like the move towards mm-hmm. comparing yourself to your sister. And so here I am, like, you know, with you sobbing in the back bedroom and not coming out the next morning, and everyone's like, we're Sherry, and we're just trying to have a picnic and just trying to <laughs> swim with the kids, and I don't know, mm-hmm. you know? And, mm-hmm. and then when my family came out, and Kelly was not doing mm-hmm. well, and it's like, because she's not doing well, you're like, oh, she has to do well. There are responsibilities. And I'm here going, there's so many bogeys and weird things. Like, we just mm-hmm. can't carry this. We've loved, mm-hmm. we've funded, we've set up a family mm-hmm. trip, mm-hmm. and we let it go. Mm-hmm. And it felt like you couldn't let it go, and mm-hmm. you were majorly tanking. And then everyone's like, Sherry, okay? How do we do this? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it feels like mm-hmm. I feel that... Like, I don't know if I can count on you, because in your truest self, you're unstoppable because you're united with God and he's flowing in you. But when you're moved towards in the service of the false, it just feels exhausting because it's always a new moment to not be okay. And and it just kind of um, despondency sets in where I just kind of mitigate for it and don't put ourselves in a place of vulnerability with people because it's just too much work to yes. undo that? Yes, buddy. Yes. <clears throat> what I hear you saying, Morgan, is that when I'm in compulsive move toward, um, the fruit for you is, I, I also hear a threat of loneliness and a feeling that you can't count on me and you don't know if I'm going to be um, taken out. And so there's a, a loneliness there and an exhaustion mm. and a... Um, sorrow Mm -hmm. and a grief and a despondency that sets in Mm -hmm. because um, you were made for a woman you can count on Mm -hmm. and that who is solid and who is operating in all three and who you know you can have rest that she's going to come through a family vacation Mm -hmm. and um, be be, have have refreshment to offer Mm -hmm. you and um, you that wasn't available to you on Mm -hmm. those two trips Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that makes me so mm. sad because I want to be a refreshment to you and I want to be strong mm. for you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Do, is there, uh, did I hear you well? Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, no, I, I, no you're there. 
Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the second, just modeling, got a few more minutes to get to the second question. If it's okay with sure. you, I'd love to mm -hmm. just kind of yeah. put it back to you instead mm -hmm. of me. How have you experienced ways I'm maturing in all three styles of relating in the service of love from my true self? Mm -hmm. And can I just reflect? Are you okay if I just mm -hmm. go your way mm -hmm. on that? Sure. Just real practical examples of I mean, even this dialogue of like, mm -hmm. feel like you're exerting yourself mm -hmm. and saying, this is what I want to do. And even mm -hmm. where we sense God leading us, a couple years ago, I would have kind of came to you and said, here's the agenda. Come with me. And you would have said, okay. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this m morning, in preparation, was you, you sensed this from God. And, you know, though I typed it out, like we wrote these together. Mm -hmm. And I felt this, I'm loving seeing you exerting your voice mm -hmm. in our partnership, mm -hmm. exerting your voice in our parenting, mm -hmm. where you've really kind of gotten my business and said, Morgan, like that I that you just gave the kids, like that's not okay. That's, a, that's new, because I've given that eye, that controlling eye to move people around the house as I want, and she's just never said anything until last month, so thank you, but I see that, and when, she, when you flex your move against muscle, it catches me, because I'm just so used to habitually you not doing that, that like, you have my attention, and you have my respect, you have my respect, because I know that's not a reflex and a reaction, I know that's hugely risky. So I see that. And then just to move away, I mean, this morning is an example. I would say a couple years ago, if we'd have woke up in the king's bed and we're, we're at this fancy place and we're going to do a session, you'd have been like, you know, on me, are we okay? What do you think about this morning? And in my business, and you just know, like, I need some space. And, you know, we cuddled it. But then, like, I need some time with God. I need to pray and center. You know, most mornings it's like get exercise. Not this morning, but... I so respected your knowing me and coming to the center of, we'll, we'll get one in union mm -hmm. with this for the session, but mm -hmm. you went and got ready in the bathroom and did your own deal, and I got to be with a cup of coffee in the chair and just seeing mm -hmm. that it wasn't about us being okay. It was a, you're moving towards God mm -hmm. and bringing him to us. Mm -hmm. And I could just feel this like, oh, we can do this mm -hmm. because I'm not carrying you. Yeah. You're yes. bringing God, mm -hmm. yes. and therefore now I'm free to turn to God and say, yes. what piece do you genuinely mm -hmm. want me to bring out of my natural yes. capacity to lead? Yes. Thank you, buddy. Because I think I've, I, I've grieved because I think that the image I've had is if Morgan and I, you know, we live in a love story set in the midst of a great and terrible battle. And what I feel like I've been for him is we're, we are in a foxhole together. By virtue of being married, we are in a foxhole together, and he doesn't know, and it, he has not known confidently on any given day if I'm going to be like shot up and laid out or if he's going to be able to count on me and I so want to and desire to be where he can look over and be like my girl's got my back mm -hmm. she's on it and we're we, she's strong and I can count on her and I can that he could actually like ah, exhale so it means so much to mm -hmm. me and I it literally like didn't occur to me to like he said we cuddled we didn't cuddle I got out of bed <laughs> felt like we cuddled <laughs> I got a bed. I want, I want to be with God. <laughs> I, won't, I won't say any more about that. But and, and anyways, she, but, but I, I actually, I, if I remember correctly, I just like actually got out of bed. You were still asleep. Yeah. And I, I went and, and got time with God in, and on, on my way. So hey, Beautiful. It's a new voice. <laughs> it's great. And, and, and here's what I want for you in us is I want to be a leader. Mm -hmm. I want to lead with a servant's heart and serve with a kingly heart and I want to fight and offer and spend ourselves over a worthy yes. cause and yet I want to have the humility mm -hmm. to defer to you mm -hmm. and to trust God's guidance through you bringing pieces that I don't have mm -hmm. knowing that as we've developed which is a whole nother time of our decision making now where mm -hmm. we come it we don't go forward until we both have a green light mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. And it's slowed us down. It's made it inefficient. Mm -hmm. But we're learning that God's leadership for our marriage comes through our union mm -hmm. and our growing capacity mm -hmm. to turn to him, to hear on, mm -hmm. on behalf of each mm -hmm. other and wrestle through the dissonance. Yes. And so that's the kind of leader I want to be. Mm -hmm. I just want to give one, Morgan's um, ability to move toward and move away and his fluency in all three styles of relating really takes my breath away. And um, the other night, I, um, we've, 
I've wrestled with God over the reality that we have two children and we don't have more. And I have a good friend who um, had also been in that boat with me, but she is um, actively, she and her husband are actively trying to conceive now. And I just felt pierced and I felt so, I was just, this, this pocket of pain, I just wanted like a do-over on all things. And I went upstairs to our bed and I got in bed and um, I, I can only imagine for a man to have your wife come crying to bed has to just, the, the um, temptation to like run for the hills. I, I just, I can't imagine the, the courage that it took for Morgan, not only um, to engage me, but to, to really move toward me in a place that that's a real tender conversation between us. And his move away, his, his willingness to drop his pen at five, even though he, there's so many things going on because he's choosing for my kiddos and our family and come home. And even he pauses before he walks in the door and just reconnects with God, that he's able to move away from, re- release people to God and not try to be God for them and not try to compulsively come through so that he is, um, he can be, I call, ironically, one of my names is Sunshine, but around our house, Morgan is Sunshine. He's just... So joy, he's like he's so joyful, and that t- we have his joy back. And it used to be um, a lot of stress, and I just feel like you have brought so much joy out of fruit of your move away, mm. and your mono- your choosing for God, and you're letting Him be God. Um, so you. I just I love love you. Thank you. I'm so honored to be your wife. Thank you guys. This was fun. Thank so you for loving us. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 So we'd love to pray for you guys in regard to this. Mm -hmm. Father, we believe that what you are after is the wholehearted integration of the human person to restore us on the level of the soul. God, through all of your streams, Lord, you're healing us. You're restoring us. You're delivering us to become wholehearted people that can walk in step with you. Therefore, living in unforced rhythms of grace, not an independent life, not a self-saving life, but a life rooted and established in you, in a present tense reality where we are not habitually reacting in the service of the false self, avoiding fear and shame, but instead we're rooted in you. Our identity is sons and daughters. We know who we are. We know whose we are. And your life is coursing through us, allowing us to pause and to respond to your movement. Spirit of God, you know when we are called to move away, even though everything around us says different. The Spirit of God saying, move away, withdraw, come to me. Come to me. Be still and know that I'm God. And then there are times, Spirit of God, where you're maturing us to know how to move towards when it feels messy to choose to crucify the false, put down the fig leaf and say, I don't know what to do, but I trust you, God, moving through me, and Mm -hmm. I choose to move towards to engage, to come to the center in love. And God, you're maturing in us how to move against in heroism and love. God, on behalf of the restoration of our own heart and the hearts of others. Yes, God. Jesus, we ask through your work that you would continue to mature in every couple here a full spectrum of styles of relating so that we might grow in wisdom and stature and favor yes, with God. God and man and that this relationship that's the very closest and the greatest trust that you've given to us yes, in God. this world would be made whole and holy Lord, that we would experience the goodness of God in the land of the living in this relationship with our spouse. God, that it would be the greatest place of hope in our life. And we say the seeds of hope that have yet to receive the rivers of life come water from heaven. Come and flow on these seeds of hope and germinate something new, an upgrade of intimacy, of oneness, of union so that we might be a city on the hill and we might come and help usher in all that you want to do in this world. We ask that you would take each couple through this exercise in your time, in your way, to receive the greater portion that you have. In Jesus' name. 
friends, these are deep waters and it takes enormous risk and a confidence that God is who he says he is. This is just the beginning of unpacking this category of the styles of relating, and there's much, much more if you're interested in exploring. And so three sort of taking action steps for those who are wanting more. This was actually a part one on the Become Good Soil podcast. There's a part two, which is episode 15. We go into the life of Jesus and explore his immense capacity to not only transcend his personality, but operate in all three styles of relating, united with God and fueled by love for other people. In this teaching, we actually do some more role-playing and deep, authentic work of coming to the center, but instead of it being me and Sherry, it's actually some like-hearted men in the context of a Become Good Soil intensive retreat. And so the intent of this podcast was to model for you, and we want to take you deeper. So part two of this podcast you can find and go deeper. And then secondly, the exercises we did and more are available to you along with those detailed descriptions in a digital PDF that you can print out. You can find deeper exercises for you to practice and those detailed descriptions on becomegoodsoil.com forward slash styles of relating. And third and final, the spirit of this podcast is to feature what we're doing at Become Good Soil. And so if you're moved to dive deeper and to wrestle, as Dallas Willard says, with the central task of the Christian life being apprenticeship and training in the depths to become like Jesus. We encourage you to subscribe to becomegoodsoil.com. As always, friends, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and a delight to walk with this fellowship of like-hearted men and women around the globe. So thanks for joining us. On behalf of the team at Wild at Heart, we love you, we bless you, and we'll be back together with you next week for another episode.